Okay. Alrighty, we are going live. I believe hosting. We are good to go. Welcome to Thursday. I hope you guys had a had a good uh, day today. I know mine was uh, pretty pretty busy. So, and I just shut down my other computer by mistake. They put the on off switch right on the left hand side. I'll tell you what, this computer started on my streaming adventure. Did pretty good until I started to get multiple uh, people dialing in and then it hogged in there and hogged down. And then yesterday I was on the phone with somebody and I spilt a cup of coffee right on the keyboard. I mean, it, it was right on the keyboard. It's still got a stain on this desk. I wiped it all off. Turned it upside down, shut it down, took the back off. There was no coffee in amongst the motherboard. Put it back together and it works better than it did before. My um, fan doesn't hum anymore and all that good stuff. So we got Vince Della Croche. We got George, Horn, George Hornfeck. Man, party time. Good to see you, George. You are the man. I haven't talked to you in a long time. You got to give me a call, brother. Gustavo, good afternoon, ready to go, ready to talk, uh, reconditioned equipment, thanks for joining. We got Vince Della Croche. Reconditioned equipment <laughs> has its limits. So do I, Vince, so do I. All right, well, we're going to be talking. We're gonna do a deep dive on reconditioned equipment. Uh, there's some changes that were happening in the 2023 version of the National Electrical Code. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. I want to talk a little bit about the uh, the existing language, and I'll tell you where I see most people sort of uh, fall off uh, the the wagon, so to speak, is just in understanding the definition. So, Luis Diego, good to see you, buddy, and glad you can dial in. Thanks for joining us. Um, all right, it's five oh one. We got uh, people in the house, and they'll be. Whoa, they'll be diving in and all that good stuff. I got to make sure I got my phone muted. Today was a busy day, and I have a great idea for next week's program. I had a phone call with an engineer today who's watching one of my older videos uh, on the infinite bus calculation. And what was really cool was we got into talking about per unit and uh, complex variables. If you're not a power systems engineer, if you're not an electrical engineer, per unit and complex variables, variables will probably, you'll just go, what the heck is he talking about? So in any case, um, we had a great discussion. I sent him some materials. I don't know if he's gonna be dialing in. He said he's, he, he found my channel. I'm not sure how he found it, but uh, he found it. So next week, I thought what I would do is go through a manual calculation on available fault current. And I'm going to use the per unit method, not the point to point method, but per unit. It's going to get really complicated really fast. So um, if, you, if you're interested, if you're, an, if you're an engineer, if you're a power systems engineer and you use SKM software and those types of applications and you wanna know what's going on behind the scenes in the software, you wanna understand the math, we're gonna talk about it next Thursday. Um, if you're not into the math, if you, <laughs> if you just wanna use the tool and you don't wanna know what's going on behind the scenes, you don't wanna dial in next Thursday. So next Thursday at five o'clock, we are going to talk short circuit calculation. We're gonna dig into doing it the hard way via the math. I'll bring up SKM, we'll, we'll run the example. We're gonna learn complex variables real and reactive components, phasers, and their angles. We're gonna learn how to add phasers, how to subtract phasers, how to divide phasers. We're gonna learn how to uh, place an ohmic value into per unit. We're gonna do a, a, system, a calculation. My thoughts are we're gonna do like a service calculation where you have a, uh, you have a utility, a transformer, uh, conductors go into a panel board. And then what I might do is also is uh, do that and then we'll do it in SKM, prove our answers. And then we're going to put a motor in parallel downstream and show you how we model 
motors and how they contribute uh, fault current. So um, that's what we're going to do next Thursday. But today we're talking reconditioned equipment. And I'll tell you what, I got to turn this heater off and my other computer's not firing up, so I don't need it. But that's the one I spilled coffee on and I was bragging about it. And now it won't turn on. So anyway. All right, so reconditioned equipment. Let's uh, let's do let's start our uh, our deep dive. Okay, here we go. You all ready? Reconditioned equipment. I tell you what, um, and, and and what you're looking at right now is I'm I'm going to be continuously developing my 2023 code change document presentation. We're going to be putting together documentation. I'll have a, I'll probably have a pamphlet and all this other good stuff. And as I help other organizations with their 2023 code cycle presentations and stuff like that. Uh, but in any case, this is a work in progress. So you are, you are seeing a work in progress and we're going to be focused in up on reconditioned equipment. And that's our topic today. I don't know. I, I, it's uh, <laughs> differential equations, Ryan Jackson. I don't know. Uh, you know what? I'll do it. I'll do it. Uh, here's what I'll do. I'll do it in per unit, but you can do it based upon a third order different third order differential. And whatever you do, please throw in a Laplace transform for me. If uh, I'd really appreciate that. Joe Bellantoni, thanks for joining in, buddy. We got Luis. We got Brian Rock in the house. What a day! It, uh, it, you know what, Brian, you can't say they all feel the same until you retire, buddy, because uh, once you retire, that's when every day is a Saturday. So, but in any case, um, welcome. Glad to see you here, buddy. Okay. And we got George Hornfeck in the house. We got, we got rock stars. All right. So the first thing I want to talk about is steps. Uh, yeah, Ryan, you can also use the FC Squared app. We're going we're gonna to do that next week. But when, I, when, I, when it comes to reconditioned, I, I'm a simple guy. And for me to, to really understand things, I have to keep things orderly. And what I'm going to help, what, I, what I'm going to do is walk through the steps uh, in my opinion, remember, everything on this channel is my opinion, my opinion only. It's not reflective of NFPA. It's not reflect, reflective of Code Making Panel 2 or 10 that I'm involved with or any other NFPA or UL standard or whatever I'm involved with. My opinion, right? Mr. Vargas, Tom, Robbie, Tom's opinion. So what I try to do is simplify things, and I'm going to walk through the steps. And the first thing you need to think about is you have to determine whatever it is you're planning on doing on whether or not it would be considered reconditioning. And I can't I can't stress this enough because it's the reason we have and I know you've got your 2020 code book because we're going to be talking 2020 code, but the reason you have article 100 in here and definitions is because we need to understand when I'm into the rule and, and there's no better example, in my opinion, than the whole concept of reconditioning. If what I am doing to a product is not considered reconditioning, then nothing in this book around reconditioning, prohibitions on whether or not I can or cannot recondition the product, anything in this book regarding labeling because I'm reconditioning doesn't have a bearing. I got to follow everything else in the book but none of the requirements around reconditioning apply because I'm not meeting the definition. GFCIs, let's talk GFCIs. If there's an area, a room in the house, why do we want to know what the heck a crawl space is? Why? Because I need to know if I have to put GFCI on the lighting outlet in that crawl space. And if it's not a crawl space, then I don't have to worry about the lighting outlet, right? Because that's why I need the definitions. So, we're going to dig a little deeper into the definition. And this is where, in my opinion, the rubber meets the road. Now, I will say that there were, a, uh, there were public inputs to change the definition of recondition for the 2023 National Electrical Code. Now, we're, where we're at in the process is we've done a hand vote, okay? And if if a hand vote is done and you pass a first revision, that doesn't mean it's going to become a first revision. 
it's I need a simple majority in the during the first revision uh, meetings, the code panel meetings. I need a simple majority to get something to survive. And if it survives, then it needs to pass ballot where it needs to get two thirds. Now I will say that if it dies at the panel, it's dead. There's no ballot. There's no looking for two thirds. It won't come to my ballot. Now, the public inputs that sought to modify the definition of reconditioned did not get a simple majority at the panel. And that means that it was they were resolved. So there's no changes anticipated as part of the first draft of the NEC around reconditioned. Now, what I want to do is I want to walk through this definition because there is so many misconceptions, misunderstandings of this, uh, of this, uh, of of this whole concept of reconditioning. I'm, I'm, I will have discussions with individuals about reconditioning, uh, say a motor, and they'll say, um, uh, "Why, why am I not allowed to recondition a motor?" And we'll go back and forth, and then I go back to the code and I go, "Wait a second, well, what are you doing to the motor?" And they're they're changing a bearing or they're they're um, you know doing something to it that um, you're not meeting the definition of recondition. Or I'll have a discussion about a panel board, about changing a circuit breaker in a panel board. And, and it's not until you understand the definition is that what you're doing to the panel board isn't reconditioned. So what I'm gonna do is walk through the first sentence in this definition says, electromechanical systems, equipment, apparatus, or components that are restored to operating conditions. So what does that tell me? That tells me that whatever it is that I'm doing, if it wasn't working before and I need to do something to it to get it to work, then I am reconditioning the product. Now, what I'm doing to get that to work is in the second sentence. In the second sentence, it says, this process differs from normal servicing of equipment that remains within a facility. So let's say, for example, um, oh man, I'm trying to think of something. If, if I'm doing general maintenance, I'm changing, uh, the, a good example, I'm changing a circuit breaker out uh, of a panel board. Say the panel board failed, uh, the, the circuit breaker failed. It's no longer, the handle doesn't turn things on and off, so I'm, I'm gonna put a new circuit breaker in. I popped the circuit breaker out, I put a new circuit breaker in. Could you say that the panel board wasn't functioning? Probably not. I'd say the panel board was functioning properly. It was the circuit breaker that wasn't functioning correctly. But I'm replacing a circuit breaker in that panel board. I'm performing normal servicing of the equipment. Um, I, and, and, and it's within my facility, so I, I'm not taking it off the wall, sending, sending it away or anything like that. So, so that activity would not be considered reconditioning. They also say in this, in the second part of this last sentence, or replacement of listed equipment on a one-to-one -one basis. So what does that mean? Well, let's say that, for example, I have an industrial control panel. And my industrial control panel has a little relay in it. And I have that relay fails. So I go to the store, I call the manufacturer and they send me a relay. And the relay is the same model number and I'm going to open the industrial control panel, take that little brick relay out, put a new relay in. I'm replacing a one for one inside of an assembly. I'm not reconditioning it. That wouldn't meet the definition. So was the industrial control panel broke? I could say, yeah, probably it wasn't working because the relay wasn't there. Uh, but if I'm replacing that device with a one-for-one, one, then it's back up and running. Brian Rock, good good point, Brian. Uh, a fuse. Uh, so if I have a fuse, a piece of equipment, say an industrial control panel that has fuses in the fuse block, and I open a fuse, and now I may go down and look and say, why did the fuse open, right? It says, you just don't replace fuses. If I notice that maybe that relay failed, and when it failed, it opened the fuse. So I take the relay out, I replace the relay, one for one, I replace the fuse, one for one, like for like, I can re-energize, I've not reconditioned that product. 
I followed the manufacturer's instructions on how to uh, replace a relay. I followed the manufacturer's instructions how to replace the fuse in that equipment. I'm not reconditioning that equipment. Was the industrial control panel not functioning? Can you argue and say, look, Tom, you took a piece of equipment and you restored it to operating conditions? I did, but I was performing normal servicing. Nothing lasts forever. The manufacturer sells replacement relays. The manufacturer sells replacement fuses. They tell me what model to put in, what uh, catalog number fuse overcurrent protective device to put in. One for one replacements. I'm not reconditioning that equipment. Now, if I, and, and they put a little informational note in here that says recondition is frequently uh, referred to as rebuilt, refurbished, or remanufactured. And that's just because everybody calls it differently, right? So that's the definition. Now, whenever, whatever you're doing on a piece of equipment, you've, it's really important that you understand what it is that you're doing, compare it to this definition, and then determine whether or not you are in the world of reconditioning because you need to figure out, am I meeting the definition? Because if you don't meet the definition, none of these requirements around the labeling and whatnot that you find in Article 110, or if, if uh, let's say that whatever you're doing to a circuit breaker, let's take, for example, you're going to add, um, you're going to add a shunt trip to a circuit breaker. So you called uh, Eaton. Uh, obviously, because it's always going to be an Eaton breaker that you're working on. Uh, so you called Eaton, you locate, you called your local application engineer in your Eaton sales office, and you told him, hey, I need to add a shunt trip capability. And oh, by the way, I want, uh, I want a, a contact on this breaker to send a status back to my, my dis distributed control system. So the, the, the sales engineer, the application engineer in the uh, Eaton sales office says, uh, okay, this is what we're going to do. Uh, we can add shunt trip capability to that device. Now, you have to, you're, gonna, you're going to take that breaker out. You're going to follow the manufacturer's instructions and add shunt trip capability. You're going to add the contact, the, uh, the outputs for dry contacts, and you're going to put that in. Hey, Jim Smith, thanks for joining us, buddy. So that activity is per manufacturer's instructions. Yes, you're modifying that circuit breaker, but you're following the manufacturer's instructions on how to do that. Now, if I have the capability to do that on a breaker, but I don't sell a kit for you to do that in the field and I don't have instructions and whatnot, but you're going to take it upon yourself to say, hey, you know what? This breaker looks just like this other circuit breaker that they sell. They sell a kit for this one, but not this one. I'm just gonna try to do this one myself. That would, that would be reconditioning because now you are taking this breaker apart. You're doing something to it that the manufacturer is not giving you guidance on. You're, you've bought a part that's not meant for that overcurrent protective device. And now you're going to, you may take it apart and go, ah, oh, I see what's wrong. I got to, I got to put a little piece of metal here to, uh, to keep this in line with each other. And then you're going to do something to get this thing working. That's reconditioning. So the moment you start getting out of that world of following manufacturer's instructions, doing what the manufacturer tells you you can do, you're into the world of reconditioning. Now, Vince Delacroche, uh, he says, we'll have a definition of servicing. Personally, I hope we don't have a definition of servicing in the National Electrical Code. Um, I think it will probably confuse things a little more. Let's take a look and see. I don't know, Vince, if you have a public input or a first revision number. I'm going to just take a quick look and uh, see if I can find that uh, definition in Article 100. So you're saying it's servicing. Just going to do a quick look if I can't find it because I thought, and it could be that uh, that they created that because I don't have that as part of my presentation. But let's take a look at we got power supply, we got primary, we got receptacles, we got remote control, safety service, separately derived systems, service conductors. I see short servicing here. It is. First revision 8449. 
And this is why I love chat. Thanks, Vince. Vince is from Siemens. So servicing, Article 100, a new definition of part of first revision 8449, if it gets a two-thirds vote, I don't know what, my guess is it probably got, uh, I, and I listened in on panel one. This is code making panel one. The process of following a manufacturer's set of instructions to analyze, adjust, or perform prescribed actions upon equipment with the intention to preserve or restore the operational performance of the equipment. Okay. So it's the process of following a manufacturer's set of instructions. I like that. And I said that earlier. Remember I said, if I, if I have a circuit breaker, I'm going to add, uh, say, shunt trip to it. I buy the part. It's identified for use with that product. I'm following the manufacturer's instructions to analyze, adjust, or perform prescribed actions upon equipment. So if I'm adding a shunt trip, uh, then I could put that, uh, then that would meet that uh, definition. To preserve or restore the operational performance of the equipment. Well, I'm not preserving and I'm not restoring. So that's the problem I have with this definition. So if I am, say, following manufacturer's instructions to add shunt trip to a circuit breaker, based upon what I'm doing, I'm adding a feature that doesn't meet the definition of servicing. It also does not meet the definition of reconditioned. So what am I doing? I don't know. I thought I knew. Till I read that definition. So let's read this again. Think about what I just said. I'm going to add a capability to this shunt trip capability to a molded case circuit breaker, which I have a part number, I have instructions, it's listed this way. This says following a manufacturer's set of instructions to analyze, I'm not analyzing, adjust. Am I adjusting it? I don't know, am I adjusting the functionality? It says, analyze, adjust, or perform prescribed actions upon equipment with the intention to preserve. I'm not preserving because it never had that functionality. I'm not preserving that functionality because I'm, I'm adding to it. And it says, or restore the operational performance. Am I restoring an operational performance? No, it was performing perfectly fine. I'm adding another feature to it. And it says, informational note, servicing often encompasses maintenance and repair activities. So I don't know. I'm not sold on that definition personally. And I remember seeing it. I didn't think it passed, but it did. So anyway, um, it is what it is. So, and what it is not, <laughs> when you talk about reconditioning, you know, if, if I have a circuit breaker, and this is another question I get, if I have a panel board and I replace the circuit breaker, which we just talked about, uh, if I put a new circuit breaker in because another circuit breaker failed, that is not reconditioning the panel board. I'm doing a one-for-one -one replacement. What would be reconditioning is if I took that breaker out, took it apart, saw that maybe uh, maybe the bimetal was bent and I, and I found another circuit breaker that had a good bimetal and I put it in there and replaced it, I'd say that would be uh, the, the uh, that would be reconditioning because it wasn't functioning. I had to fabricate something. I'm not following manufacturer's instructions and the breaker was broke. So now I would meet the definition of reconditioning or remanufacturing or whatever you want to call it, refurbishing. Then I would have to go back to, um, I'd go, I have to go back to 240 to see, am I even permitted to do what I plan to do? Now that I've determined that what I'm doing is reconditioning, then I need to figure out Am I permitted to do it or am I prohibited from doing it? So that's the other thing you got to think about. And we'll talk about that a little bit. But uh, so what is not considered reconditioning? I would say following manufacturer's instructions, similar to the, the uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, first revision 8449, which uh, let's just take, I'm going to take a look and see. Uh, that was public input 26, 2969. 2969. Oh, that's a, that, that was NEMA's. That was NEMA's public input. And I remember, I think I voted against that at uh, Codes and Standards. At least I remember speaking against it. I don't, I just don't care for, uh, I just don't care for that definition. And it's the preserve or restore the operational performance. But you know what? Like Mark Early would tell me, or Jeff Sargent now, look forward to your public comment. So it depends on how much I don't like.
<laughs> All right. So, okay. So, talked a little bit about what is not. Let's talk about what is reconditioning. Now, uh, we said replacing a circuit breaker in a panel board, not reconditioning, but if I take that breaker out and I start to take it apart, try to get it working again, now I'm into reconditioning. Uh, let's take a, another example, say an automatic transfer switch. Let's say that I have a transfer switch and in that transfer switch, uh, during the transfer, there is a mechanism, a bar or whatnot that's sort of bent because uh, for some reason, something was not aligned correctly and I bent a, uh, a fabricated uh, a bra bracket in there. And I said, you know, I can take the, uh, the fabricated uh, piece out of there and I can, it's just a piece of metal. I know the shape. I'm going to go on my, uh, uh, I'm going to get my, uh, my, my Miller uh, plasma cutter out <laughs> and I'm going to uh, fabricate myself another bracket. I'll drill the holes exactly the same. It'll look exactly the same. I'll even spray paint it the right color and I put it back in again to get the transfer switch back up and running again. I'm reconditioning. Now, if I called the manufacturer and the manufacturer said, oh yeah, you know what? We have a kit for that and it's listed or it's identified for use in that, then that's okay. Now I'm gonna get that kit. I'm gonna do the replacement per the manufacturer's instructions. I'm gonna get it back up and running again. That's not reconditioning because Again, all I need is the definition of reconditioned to determine that. I don't need another definition of servicing. I don't need another definition of anything else because all I do is go to reconditioning and it says the process differs from normal servicing of equipment that remains within a facility. If I'm following manufacturer's instructions to replace a part a relay, a bracket, whatever it is. It's normal servicing. Normal servicing is defined and dictated by the manufacturer of the product. The if the manufacturer has instructions on how to replace components, how to add uh, features to it, whatever it is, they're listed that way. They're tested that way. They're designed to permit you to do that. That is normal servicing. I don't need any other definition. Joe Bellantoni, wouldn't adding an accessory such as a shunt trip into the molded case circuit breaker be more of a modification? The breaker was operational before and after the added accessory. Right. So, so the important part of that, and, and, and that's why I get frustrated when people think I need new terms. I need more stuff in the code. The existing definition is so, it's perfect. It's maybe it's not perfect. I mean, it's, I think it's very clear. I'm following manufacturer's instructions. If I am going to add a component, I'm following manufacturer's instructions. I'm doing normal servicing of that equipment. Yeah, I might be. Um, um, it, it was. It was the the circuit breaker was, was working fine to your to Joe's point. It was working fine before. It was working fine after. I just did a slight modification and I uh, I followed manufacturer's instruction and added a feature to it. And now it's working fine again. So, I mean, there are so many things that you can buy. A drill. I just bought a router. I, I, I've been uh, doing, uh, building some cabinets and stuff in, the, in, in my garage. And I, I bought a router and it comes with accessories. Right? I can buy accessories. And, and the manufacturer of the, of the router, and in this case, it's a porter cable, 7518. I'll tell you what, if you have a porter cable, 7518, it's like gold right now. They're not making them anymore. And you can't find them. There's no stores that have them. But in any case, you can buy accessories for these things and they're listed and they're identified for the use. There's instructions on how to put it together. So I'm, and I'm adding functionality to that router. Same thing when it comes to circuit breakers or other electrical equipment. It's not reconditioning. So Joe, very good point. Uh, Brian Rock says, but not salvaged. We don't need to know <laughs> thinking salvaging. Yeah, it's so so here's the other thing with that, Brian. So what about I buy I buy I get a circuit breaker that was uh oh, I, there's a building down the road. They're tearing it down. I go down to the owner and I say, "Hey, what are you going to do with all these breakers that you've got cuz I have the exact same panel boards and I can use your breakers." And he says, "Sure, I'll I'll sell them to you." So you buy them from him. 
and you bring them over to your facility. Now, you have a bunch of, uh, you have these uh, circuit breakers that are from someone else's facility. They'll fit in your panel board. Are they working? So what do you do? You go and you get NEMA AB4. It's a free download off the NEMA website. Uh, and you can do some testing on this breaker. You can turn the handle on and off. You can test the contact resistance. They give you descriptions on how to do that. You've looked at the case. It all looks good. And now you're going to use it in your piece of equipment. Is that a reconditioned circuit breaker? No. Why not? Are you fixing it? You may have dusted it off. You tested the breakers. You didn't take it apart. The handle goes up and on and off. You... Uh, you, put, uh, you tested the contact resistance. You know that the mechanism seems to be working. Maybe you put some current through it and it tripped. You're reusing a piece of equipment. So to Brian Rocks, are you salvaging it? Yeah, well, you're salvaging it, yeah. Now, here's the risk you take. You don't know the history of that product. Think about uh, a circuit breaker. Think about what happens if it hit if it opened on a short circuit current more than once, you don't know because you don't know the history of that product. What if instead of just down the street, what if say it's down the street and you buy that product and then you find out that, oh man, I didn't realize this, but that whole facility was underwater for a week. When you, the breaker was really clean when I got it. Do you know what's going on inside? No, you don't. The moment you crack the seal and start taking it apart, you're reconditioning it. I don't care if you take it apart and you look at it and you put it back together again, you crack that seal, an inspector or anybody else is gonna say, you took that apart, we don't know what you did in the inside, uh, and then are, are you putting it back together correctly? All of that stuff matters. So, and then even the screws. So there's the other, the other thing is some screws are almost like a self-tapping that when, you, when, you, when we first put them in, we're breaking into virgin material. And that screw is, is digging into the thermoset or the thermoplastic or whatever it is. You take that screw out and you try to put it back in again, it's not going to hold like the original one did. So there's a lot of those little details that you not, may not be aware of that once you start messing with it, it's, and you're going to be relying on this for life safety reasons. So it may not meet the definition of reconditioned. All you're doing is reusing it. And, but there's risks involved with that. Uh, Vince Delacroche, uh, additional free resource for information, NEMA, CS. And what, you, what I would do is, um, that, that's a good, good point. Uh, what you can do is Google, go to your Google and type in NEMA CS100 and you'll find that and you'll be able to download it and those are free downloads. So, um, so hopefully you get a little, it's really important to understand the definition. It's really important to understand what it is that you're doing on uh, a piece of equipment to determine whether or not what you're doing is actually reconditioning it, okay? So that's the first step. Also, manufacturer provides additional parts for different installations, yeah. That's a good point, Brian. Good point. Uh, you know, and, and again, I, I might, uh, you know, you're, it's not, when you're following manufacturer's instructions, you are in good company because now you have the manufacturer supporting you, right? The manufacturer's created instructions. And you, if you read that, you, you might see text in this as a qualified individual. You might be able to contact the manufacturer and say, hey, this is what I'm doing on these circuit breakers. Is this something I can do? They may go, no, you, you probably don't want to do that yourself if you've never done it because here are the, some of the hiccups. Here's an individual who does that type of work for you. Or maybe the manufacturer sends somebody out or the manufacturer might say, hey, look, come on in and we'll show you how to do it. Okay, and then you can do that on your own. Some stuff is really simple. Some stuff is a little complicated, right? All right. So the second one, once you have identified that my activity is reconditioning, the next thing you have to ask is, can I recondition this equipment? And the one I get a lot of questions on is motors. 
I have a lot of individuals who before, when, when, when this first one in the National Electrical Code for the 2020 version, I was getting a lot of phone calls with people saying, I'm not permitted to recondition a motor anymore. And that couldn't be further from the truth. You can recondition a motor. There's nothing in Article 430. So what you have to do at this point is look at what is the equipment that I'm working on and then go to the applicable area in the National Electrical Code that governs that product and determine are there, is there any language in there that says I'm not allowed to recondition it? Now, I can tell you from a, from a 2020 process perspective what happened. The first draft, there were changes that were sought in Article 110. I don't know. I don't believe they passed. Uh, then the correlating committee put a note out to all of the code, make, code making panels to say, look, you guys should all be looking at the reconditioning of equipment under your purview and each code making panel made decisions. So for example, panel 10 is overcurrent protection. So they made decisions as to whether or not you can recondition circuit breakers, whether it be a multi case circuit breaker, insulated case circuit breaker, power circuit breaker, low voltage, medium voltage, fuses, low voltage and medium voltage, fuse holders. So they governed all of that. Healthcare handles, healthcare equipment. They made some requirements. Um, Fire pumps, panel 13 looked at transfer switches and fire pumps and, and the products that they have uh, say so over. So what you and what you would need to do is say, okay, let's go take a look at the different locations in the National Electrical Code. 210. So when I'm going to show you anything with a red star changed in the 2023 or is probably going to change in the 2023 code cycle. Uh, I, I call it give 210.15 got a little love in, uh, in during the first draft meetings. Now, remember, we're at the hand vote. The, the changes that, we, that I'm going to talk about in 210.15 may or may not make it uh, to the first draft report. But uh, suffice it to say, it, if it doesn't make it, then uh, you will, it's fair game for comments phase because it's not new material. Now, 210.15 was new in the 2020 code cycle. So if you go to page 70.65 in your book, it says the following shall not be reconditioned. Equipment that provides G GFCI for personnel, GFCI. Equipment that provides AFCI protection. And then equipment that provides groundfall protection of equipment. Now, what happened in the 2023 code cycle is a little bit of a little bit of this to that let's try that that way you can see all the language so 21015 if it passes the 2023 cycle is going to say reconditioned equipment shall be listed as reconditioned and the original listing mark removed uh, now there's a difference in what's in 110 because Article 110 doesn't say when you recondition equipment has to be listed. The only place in the 2020 code cycle was actually in 240, I believe it was 240.88. We're gonna cover it. I just wanna make sure I got the right numbers. 240.88, reconditioning of circuit breakers specifically said that Reconditioned equipment shall be listed as reconditioned. So that philosophy carried over to Article 210. In the 2023 cycle, it looks like we're going to be requiring that if, it's, if you recondition uh, a uh, reconditioned equipment, has to be listed as being reconditioned. So, uh, But unfortunately, in 210.15, all we do is tell you that you can't recondition um, GSCIs and AFCIs. Now you'll say, why did we remove ground fault protection of equipment? What you're going to see is panel 10, who, who basically has requirements for ground fault protection of equipment, they have the reconditioning uh, rules for GFPE, and, and they're better suited. They've got the, uh, the expertise on that code panel to handle uh, GFPE, so they're better off with that. So in any case, uh, GFCIs and AFCIs, and I don't know anybody who would. Now, just think about it. Receptacles and wiring device, no one's going to be reconditioning a receptacle. 
right? And you're not permitted to recondition receptacles anyway. We're going to talk about that. Uh, circuit breakers, molded case circuit breakers, we're going to talk about it in 240.88, tells you how you can't recondition a molded case circuit breaker. So if your AFCI is in a molded case circuit breaker, you're not going to be able to recondition that anyway. So I'm, I'm sort of, I'm on the fence on, do we even need 210.15? Having it in there doesn't do any, any, any harm, um, but I could make arguments that these technologies of AFCI and GFCI are in other types of equipment like circuit breakers and receptacles that you're not permitted to recondition anyway. So, but you never know. You never know. There might be a little external box somebody makes. So in any case, uh, the reason that, G, that the GFPE was deleted there is because it's over in 240. So two uh, no, so that tells me if I have a GFCI, if I'm going to do, if I'm going to do actions on a GFCI receptacle, that would be getting it back to working order, taking it apart. Maybe I want to take the faceplate off of another one, put it on. Maybe I took it apart and I found the contacts were welded, and I break them off and I put a new set of contacts from another device. Not allowed to do that. Two ten. You're meeting the definition of, of uh, reconditioning. Per 210, you're not allowed. So Article 240, you have 240.62. 240.62 says, see, you're in the 60s. So that's going to be fuses. So you remember, um, Part 7 is circuit breakers, and that starts at 240.80. Part 6 is plug fuses, fuse holders, and adapters. That starts at 240.50. So if you're in between 240.50 and 240.80, you know you're dealing with fuses. So 240.62, reconditioned equipment, low voltage fuse holders and low voltage non-renewable non fuses shall not be permitted to be reconditioned. So if I'm going to do something to a fuse holder, I broke a clip off and I'm going to replace the clip, I'm... It's not, it's not based on manufacturers. The manufacturer doesn't sell new clips. I'm going to solder it up, okay? I'm, gonna, I've got, I'm a trained welder now. You know, I've got my Miller 211 out in the uh, garage. I'm going to weld this puppy up. I can even weld aluminum, right? I'm not following manufacturer's instructions. Not working. I'm taking it to working. If it is a fuse holder, a low-voltage fuse holder, I'm not permitted to do it. I've met the definition. I've established I've met the definition of reconditioning. My actions are not permitted on that product. 240.88, that's the circuit breaker one. Now I'm gonna show you what the uh, 20, uh, 23 code cycle says, but 240.88, if you look in your code book, you'll see that whole section was new. And what uh, it said before was molded case circuit breakers shall not be permitted to be reconditioned. Low and medium voltage power circuit breakers shall uh, shall be permitted to be reconditioned. I think, Ryan, I think you put in a public input, Ryan Jackson, uh, you put a public input in that's uh, pointed out the fact that we have medium voltage requirements on medium voltage breakers in a section that doesn't apply to medium voltage. So we did do what you uh, had suggested and we moved some things around and that's why you see the changes here. So right now we have A, molded case circuit breakers, uh, molded case circuit breakers shall not be permitted to be reconditioned. B, uh, low and medium voltage, low voltage power circuit breakers shall be permitted to be reconditioned. Low voltage power circuit breakers and electronic trip units shall not be permitted to be reconditioned. What we're going to have to do is uh, we're going to have to go back to the language in, let me go into Terra here. Because if the title of B still has medium voltage, then we're going to have to clean that up in, um, this is 240.88. We're going to have to clean that up in the second draft because uh, we moved the uh, medium voltage. So 240.88, the Terra, Terra view is, is difficult to read sometimes. So I'm going to look at the first revision. Uh, 7824. So what you'll notice on my slides down there on the bottom, uh, you'll see where it says 7824. That's the first revision number. And if I look at the first revision, B says low voltage power circuit breakers 
All right, so medium is struck out. Okay, yeah, so it is. It's struck out. I, I'm, I'm reading some small text. So it's just low voltage power circuit breakers. The word medium is struck out. Yep, sorry, Ryan. I'm reading a, uh, I'm, I'm reading small text over here. I should have been reading this monitor. I'm looking at a little tiny window. Gosh, it's five. It's after five o'clock. I mean, give me a break. It's a busy day today. All right, so we fixed that. Thanks, Ryan, for uh, bringing that up to panel 10. So we did, uh, we did make those adjustments. And the panel statement says, this revision removed requirements for medium and high voltage circuit breakers and an additional FR was created, uh, creates new subdivisions in 240.102 in part nine. So, and that's uh, to, your, uh, to your credit, Ryan, good, good catch on that one. And then we made some editorial changes. All right. So that is 240.80. I look, this, this little is, is, is a little screen. It's about this. The text is like that big. This one over here has text. It's a little bit bigger, but not. This one is really big. I don't know why I don't just look at this monitor. So that was 240.62. We went over 240.88. 240.102, that's a new one. 240.102 says, hey, you're going to love this, Mr. Jackson, uh, medium voltage fuse holders. So we move fuse holders up there as well. Medium voltage fuse holders and medium voltage non-renewable fuses shall not be permitted to be reconditioned. That was existing language. We created an A, B, and C. So we had to create A, first level subdivision. We created B, medium voltage power circuit breakers, and then C, high voltage circuit breakers. So you are permitted to recondition medium voltage circuit breakers and high voltage circuit breakers. Um, those are big boys and there's a lot of parts in there and we sell parts and we recondition those ourselves. There's a lot of individuals in the marketplace that will uh, rebuild those things for you. I could take an old, uh, an old um, uh, power circuit breaker and recondition it. I, I didn't throw pictures of those in here uh, primarily because uh, I'm trying to keep the footprint of this PowerPoint low. And what better, what, what images of products do you need? You got, you got me, right? You don't need any other images. You got, you got, you got Tom. So no better picture. All right. So that's 240. So, you know, if you're working on a power circuit breaker, a listed power circuit breaker, go to 240.88, low voltage you know you're permitted to recondition it, you're golden. Now, the next layer is what we're going to talk about a little bit later on when, you're getting, when you get into that process. 242 is over voltage protection. They added uh, requirements in, and this is for the, it didn't exist. Uh, there weren't any requirements. If you go to 242 in your 2020 code book, you won't find anything about reconditioning, but they did add language. Uh, in 242.7, surge protected devices shall not be permitted to be reconditioned. You know, when the MOV finally gives its life for you, um, you're not going to replace those MOV. Ryan says, interesting that the listing requirement for medium voltage and high voltage reconditioned breakers is gone. Was that intentional? It wasn't. Reconditioned equipment shall be listed as reconditioned in 240.88. 240.102. Meaning voltage fuse with so non really should be made. Blah, 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 blah. Well, okay. So here's what I'll say. Um, when you get into medium voltage equipment, it's a different beast. There is some equipment, medium voltage equipment that are not listed. There's, you're not going to find, well, let me just say this. To my knowledge, <laughs> medium voltage circuit breakers are listed, to my knowledge. Can I make, do, or, or, could I have a medium voltage breaker out there that's not listed? Yes. Would I be permitted to be used, to use it? Yes. Why? Well, 
The National Electrical Code, the 2020 version of the National Electrical Code, does not require a circuit breaker to be listed. So if I'm applying a medium voltage circuit breaker in other than a utility application, you probably will have inspectors to say, I want it listed. If you're in Shelby County, Alabama, it's going to be listed. But there are other methods that inspectors can use to verify the performance and the capabilities of that device. If I'm in a utility application, I don't need to be a listed product. Utilities don't follow the National Electrical Code. Now, I will say that the 2023 version of the National Electrical Code will require medium voltage and low voltage power circuit breakers to be listed products. So the 2023 code is changing and we moved that equipment up there in the medium voltage world. But honestly, Ryan, I can tell you, I don't recall discussing it. I, 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 we did not talk about it. We talked about, and, and I argued a little bit against uh, the listing requirement of medium voltage circuit breakers. I believe the language passed. Let's, uh, I'm gonna take a quick look in, in TerraView to see where in 240, it's going to be up front in 240. Uh, uh, just gonna take a quick look and see what the language says on what we decided for listing requirements of circuit breakers. 240, 240.6. Oh, wait, maybe it's in. Because I know we have a requirement. Maybe it's actually in 240. Maybe it's after 240.80. Let me look in part seven. There's part six. We did in part in part six, we said in 240.60, 240.60E. Fuse reducers shall be listed. That's new. Uh, in 240. Dot, 240. Dot, I'm not seeing it. I know we have it in here somewhere. Series ratings. We got applications. Got performance testing methods. Man, for the for the life of me, I'm not finding it. Um, protection of flexible cords, standard ampere rating is not going to be there. It's somewhere. I know we rec we 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 have a requirement in here somewhere. I'm not sure where it is, but um, yeah, if you could throw a public comment in there, that'll at least uh, get us looking at it. But but you've because even if it says that circuit breakers have to be so two forty dot seventy. See, I'm on a lag, so I'm a couple minutes behind uh, your your messages. So 240.70, thank you. It's hard to, it's hard for me. Ah, 3106. Oh. Okay, so it's not, I can't, I have to, I have to actually look. So I'm going to, so the public input is 3106. Let's take a look at the public input. 3106. I'll show you what I'm doing here. So I'm going in, I, um, I'm going to do a close. I went into my uh, first draft, my, my public, uh, my first draft stuff, pair of you. I click on report on this. I click public inputs and I'll type in, Ryan says it's 3106. I'll do a search. Uh, and there's a first revision 7805. And let's go to first revision 7805 says, branch circuit overcurrent protected devices shall be listed. Overcurrent protection devices pr protecting branch feeder or service conductors are safety critical devices that have long been required by HJs as listed. And it, so there's no, uh, uh, this is 240.7. 240.7. Thanks, Daryl. Daryl Hill in the house. There's a guy. Hey, Daryl, I know you guys, you deal with wood. I just bought some new routers, buddy. 
So I'm 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 uh, I'm, I'm I'm carving wood. I'm gonna start making I'm, I'm making some cabinets and all that good stuff. So remember two forty dot six. Um, if you look at the part one, oh man, my glasses. Part one says. Um, Parts one through seven of this article provide the general requirements for overcurrent protection and overcurrent protective devices, not more than a thousand volts. So because this is in 240.7, it only applies to circuit breakers less than or equal to a thousand volts. So medium voltage breakers are not required to be listed. Wood is good. Hear that? Wood is good. So, uh, because it's in 240.7, now if it was back up there in 240, well, even 240.70, it would have to, we would have to look and see if there's anything, and we didn't do anything in, uh, in the medium voltage world. So, uh, a medium voltage circuit breaker is still not required to be listed just because of the placement of 240.7. Good. Uh, we took a little bit of a detour, but I think we learned something there. All right, so 240.7. So we talked about uh, 242. We saw that, I don't know if we talked this one yet. This is 242.41, surge arresters. So we had SPDs, now we have surge arresters, not permitted, and it's a simple text. So. There's not a big fanfare for that. Now, 406, we have the requirements in 406 for receptacles, uh, cord connectors, and attachments plugs. That did not change in the 2023 cycle. No one's looking at, uh, there's no first revision associated with it. I don't think there were any public inputs on it. So 406.3a, uh, you guys can read that. At least you have the reference and 406.7. So those are your receptacles, core connectors, and attachment plugs. 408, so 408.8. Let's go to 408. That section changed. Remember in 408.8, reconditioning equipment. Reconditioning of equipment within the scope of this article shall be limited as described in 408.8 A and B. And A speaks to panel boards, and B speaks to switch boards and switch gears. Panel boards are not permitted to be reconditioned. Switch boards and switch gear uh, or sections of switchboards or switchgear shall be permitted to be reconditioned. So uh, let's take a look at what 408.8 uh, changes, what changes are there in the uh, 2023 cycle. They're looking at uh, uh, a change up here in the positive text about corrosive influences or water. So there's some discussion at the panel about corrosive environments. Uh, and they added a sentence, reconditioned equipment shall be listed or field labeled as reconditioned and marked in accordance with 110.21A2. So uh, switchboards and switchgear are still permitted to be uh, reconditioned and they added uh, switchboards in there and that was a little mistake that we had. We missed that in the, in the 2020 cycle. Switchboards and switchgear shall be listed uh, or field labeled as reconditioned. So they just, uh, in fact, they don't even need that text there. They have to, they, they could put that uh, above. And, um, and they referenced 110.21A2, and we're going to talk about the changes there. And they removed the previously applied listing marks, if any, within the portions of reconditioning that we removed. They removed that because that language is now 110.21A2, and we're going to go there here shortly. So stand by me here. So that's sort of what they did in 408. They didn't change the intent. Uh, they just they did tell you it has to be listed as reconditioned. So remember in the 2020 code cycle, the only place reconditioned equipment is required to be listed is on circuit breakers in 240.88, nowhere else. Um, and, and you know, Ryan, if you put a public input in on the medium voltage, that's going to cause us to debate on whether or not medium voltage breakers in themselves need to be listed. There's a debate. All right, 410. Now we're going to go to 410. 410.7 did some changes there. So 410 got a little bit of love. 410.7 says they added ballasts, LED drivers, and lamps. 
as not being permitted to recondition. So if you're gonna take a ballast apart, you're gonna do something with LED drivers or, or lamps, ain't gonna happen, right? And let's take a look, the, um, the um, substantiation or the panel statement says, lighting ballasts, LED drivers and lamps are constructed using specialized materials, parts and techniques that are specified by the original equipment manufacturer. If these factors are not properly considered during reconditioning, important safety features may not function properly. Additionally, if proper materials, parts, or equipment are not used, the integrity of the reconditioned devices may not be assured and the reliability is compromised. So, uh, and there's a safety factor there as well. I mean, you, you've got a lot of electrical workers working in lighting fixtures and all this other good stuff. We want to keep those Daryl Hills alive out there, you know, and those Ryan Jacksons and anybody else who carries a tool. All right. So uh, low voltage lighting, not a lot of recondition that that's in 411, uh, 490 equipment over a thousand volts. So 490.49 got a little bit of love. This uh, they struck out some language and previously applied listing marks, if any, within the portion uh, shall be removed. And, and all they're doing is saying, look, go back and look at 110.21A2. So 110.21 got a little love. So we're going to go and take a look at that as well. All right. 404 switches. Let's take a look at what happened in 404. They added lighting. So this is new language. 404.16 is totally new for the 2023 cycle. It's not in the 2020 code. Uh, if it survives um, first draft, it will be able for you to comment on. Lighting, dimmer, and electronic control switches shall not be permitted to be reconditioned. Snap switches of any type shall not be permitted to be reconditioned. Knife switches, switches with butt, con butt contacts, and bolted pressure contact switches shall be permitted to be reconditioned. But look at it says, it says the reconditioned process shall use design qualified parts verified under applicable standards and shall be performed in accordance with any instructions provided by the manufacturer. If equipment has been damaged by fire, products of combustion, corrosive influences or water, it shall be specifically evaluated by its manufacturer or a qualified testing laboratory prior to being returned to service. Reconditioned switches shall be listed or field labeled as reconditioned and marked in accordance with 110.21A2. Are you seeing a theme? I am. So uh, that's first revision 7859, totally new for um, Article 404. Another new is generators, 445. Let's take a look at generators. This is new language for the 2023 cycle. Again, pass the hand vote. We gotta wait to see if it gets past ballot. So what does it say? The reconditioning of generators shall be in accordance with instructions provided by a generator manufacturer. The generator nameplate shall not be required to be removed. Where a generator is reconditioned, it shall be identified as reconditioned and marked in accordance with 110.21A2. Reconditioned, rewound, or repaired classified hazardous generators identified for use in Class 1 Div 1 locations shall be listed as reconditioned or certified as reconditioned. And then uh, there's an informational note tells you what standards to look at recommended for practice for the repair of rotating electrical apparatus. And then informational number two says to see CFR Title 40 for emissions, nameplate, etc. Now, there, uh, you know, what I'm learning is on the motor and generator side, there's a requirement. It's not a requirement. It's, it's not in the standard that the label, the listing mark has to be on the nameplate. It's typically requested by the NERDL, the nationally recognized testing laboratory that's listing it, that will ask the manufacturer to put that uh, listing mark on the nameplate. Now, the challenge it presents when we say that you have to remove the original listing mark, if it's a part of the nameplate, they say, well, I have to take it off of the nameplate. If you're reconditioning, you're probably replacing the whole nameplate anyway, okay? But in any case, um, uh, 
that presented a little challenge and concern for the industry around motors and uh, generators and whatnot. So in any case, uh, there's language in here uh, to help you with, uh, with generators. And two other sections are in Article 470 for resistors and reactors. Both of these are pretty much exactly the same. Reconditioning of resistors shall not be permitted. Reconditioning of reactors shall be in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. So um, both of these, 470.5 and 470.21, are pretty much the same. 517.75 hasn't changed. Go check that one and read it. There is a new requirement in 555. So uh, I'm going to move over to Article 555 a little bit because uh, 555 talks about replacement of equipment. I, I wouldn't say it's, it's directly related with reconditioning, but what they did in 555, I think, is uh, going to be a historical moment. It says uh, it deals electrical enclosures, devices, or wiring methods on a docking facility. They talk about modifications, replacements, and, repla and repairs. And it says that if you're doing any modifications, replacement, and repairs, you have to comply with the provisions of this code. So if you, uh, you know, I, I think that sort of brings in reconditioning. If you're going to take a pedestal, try to refurbish it, get it back up and running, maybe you hit it with the boat, you cracked it, all of that good stuff. You're going to be following the National Electrical Code and any of the requirements around reconditioning there. They talk about modifications, replacements, repairs of electrical closures, devices, um, shall require an inspection of the entire circuit. Uh, and all equipment has been recognized as being damaged or compromised during the inspection shall be identified documented and repaired by a qualified person. You notice they're using the word repaired, but you really, this is going to, this is probably going to uh, generate some discussion about what you can and can't do on equipment in and around marinas. And they're referencing 303. So be mindful of what's going on in 555. Uh, there's a lot going on, I believe, in, that, in those areas. 660, 695, fire pumps and x-ray equipment didn't change. You know, there's prohibitions on there's a prohibition on reconditioning fire pump controllers, but you're permitted to uh, recondition X-ray equipment. Uh, 700, 701, 702, and 708. Uh, there are uh, requirements on reconditioning. You're not allowed to recondition transfer switches. If you look at 702.5, uh, there's they they added a word interconnection or transfer equipment. They, they uh, speak to interconnection or transfer equipment. equipment shall be suitable for the intended use and shall be listed, designed, and installed so as to prevent the inadvertent interconnection of all sources uh, of supply in any operation of the equipment. So, and then you have uh, uh, equipment shall be suitable for the intended use and shall be listed, designed, and installed so as to prevent the inadvertent interconnection of all sources of supply in any operation of the equipment. Uh, so it's talking about intercorrection, um, just looking for the language it speaks to. There it is. Transfer switches shall not be permitted to be reconditioned. That is not new. That was already in the code, but it's in a different section now. So uh, just be mindful that it's moved a little bit. Same requirements as before. And so you can read 702 when it comes out. And 708 is uh, same thing. They just move things around a little bit. 800.3G didn't change. You're into that stuff. Go take a look at it. So now you're going to recondition. You know you're permitted to recondition. You've gone through the code sections. You're dealing with a motor and you know you're permitted to recondition a motor. You're dealing with a uh, switchboard or switch gear. You re you're permitted to recondition. Now we get into 110.21. And this is where we have to sit down and say, what is it that I'm allowed to uh, what do I have to do when I get into this process? First revision 8581 tells us uh, that the, and, and, and existing language, the only thing that changed in 8581 is what's underlined, where it says the marking shall be of sufficient durability. Uh, you have to have the manufacturer's name, trademark, or other descriptive marking. Uh, so if you are going to recondition it, you got to put your name on it uh, and you have to, you own it, right? So if you are reconditioning a piece of my switch gear, uh, it's your switch gear now, right? So you're reconditioning. Owner can't come back to me and ask me why it's not working. Owner can't come to me if it burns down their facility. Uh, you are modifying that equipment. You're taking ownership of it. 
You need to put your name on it. And it's about transparency for everybody involved. Now, in 110.21A2, they sort of, uh, if, you, if you look at your 2020 code book, uh, 110.21, helps if you have this, 110.21A2, 110.21, 110.21, A2. Uh, Daryl Hill, 240.71 apply to medium voltage and high voltage breakers. That's correct. Uh, wood is good. So 110.21. I'm just checking the comments out as I'm finding things. So 110.21A2 was not separated into an A, B, and C. It is now. So what panel one did was they sort of modified this to say, Reconditioned equipment shall be marked with the following. A is the name, trademark, or other descriptive marking of the organization that performed the reconditioning. We just talked about that. They didn't change the, the, the requirements there. You have to put the date of reconditioning. And then C, the term reconditioned or other approved wording or symbol indicating that the equipment has been reconditioned. We're talking transparency. That's it. We're not talking about um, anything other than you want to make sure that if I, if my handle broke off of this cup and I replaced it or made a new handle and put it on here, it's no longer a manufacturer. If, if Eaton made this cup, yeah, Eaton made the cup, but I'm going to put my name on it to say this was reconditioned and the date that I reconditioned it the name of my company, my trademark, or any other descriptive marking for Thomas Dimitrovich Enterprises. And, um, and then it says the original listing mark shall be removed or made permanently illegible or made permanently illegible. <clears throat> that helps the motor guys and the generator guys because let's say that uh, the nameplate and the listing mark is on the nameplate, which has... Uh, information on this cup that tells me how uh, how much water, how much coffee it holds, and uh, uh, it, it has uh, the rating of this from a temperature perspective. I don't want to have to remove that label. Now I just need to make sure that the original listing mark is permanently illegible, and I could scratch it out. I could mark it, whatever. The equipment nameplate shall not be required to be removed or made permanently illegible. Only the part of the nameplate that includes the listing mark. And this is for the motor guys. The motor guys were having a fit because the UL listing or the ETL listing or whatever nurdle they use to list their, their motor is going to be on the nameplate. It's not required in the UL standard for motors. It's required by the nationally tech... It's required by the nurdle. So they'll ask for that listing mark to be a part of the nameplate. It's not required by the code either. The National Electrical Code 430 does not require you to put the listing mark on the, on the, uh, on the label, the nameplate of the motor. It lists everything that you're required to have on the listing, on the nameplate of the motor. The UL or the listing mark is not one of those items. If you go to the standard for motors, it's not one of those items, but the nurdle nationally recognized testing laboratory that you're using to list that motor is going to say, we want it on there. Now, can you ask them to not put it on that motor? Sure. You know, you can might not put it on the nameplate of the motor. That's been done before by uh, UL, at least I've asked that question of UL and they've permitted that in certain applications. But this is to appease that faction of the industry, which, uh, which I believe this will make them happy. All right. Um, ANSI approved standards are available for application of reconditioning. And then the term recondition may be uh, interchangeable with the terms rebuilt, refurbished, or remanufactured, even though these are sometimes different processes. So that was clarity that was added. All right. And then in B, in 110.21B, the field uh, hazards, that changed, but I'm not going to get into that because that doesn't have anything to do with reconditioning. All right, all right. Okay, now we can't forget it. Now this was 110.21, uh, I believe this 
is the 2020 version of 110.21, which I've already talked about. So we know what the changes were. So what's Brian, if I see Brian, Brian says certification labels may not have the durability of product labels mandated by the product standard created by the standards development organization. All right. Certification labels, persistence and durability are the at the discretion of the certification body. So that might explain why they require it uh, on the motor nameplate. Duty to warn, clarity of understanding, persistence of warning is the primary concern when dealing with product liabilities. So good point, Brian. Thanks for uh, contributing in the chat box. So if those of you are maybe listening to this while you're driving down the road, uh, you're gonna wanna check back and take a look at the live chat that's going on. There's a lot of good information in there. So if I'm going to recondition it, I know that I'm going to put my name on it. I am going to remove the original listing mark or obliterate it, make sure that it's not discernible. In some cases, and it looks like from what we read in, in a lot of the different articles, you're going to have to list it as reconditioned. And what that will require is a field evaluation and you'll need the a nationally recognized testing laboratory to come out and do that evaluation and apply a label in the field um, that identifies it as being reconditioned now a lot of the questions say is the original listing label still valid so the original ul listing mark says that the equipment met the applicable ul standards when the product left the factory. The moment you start modifying, you will, that, certifi that third party certification body or ETL or any other nationally recognized testing laboratory that did the evaluation for you, they don't know if what you did compromised the performance of that product based upon how it was listed and tested. Not unless they get a look at it. And in some cases, they'll specifically tell you, you can't recondition or refurbish this. Because they know that on how the, how the parts and whatnot are all going together. So can you all uh, list, can you all listed equipment be rebuilt? Now, when I say you all listed, I don't mean listed by you all. I mean listed to a you all standard. If it's ETL, it's Intertech. If it's uh, any one of the other nationally recognized testing laboratories who's listed the product, can it be rebuilt? Now, there are rebuilding programs by nationally recognized testing laboratories. There are, um, they reference the most recent uh, current standard. And in some cases, the standard will have provisions to address the reconditioning, refurbishing, or remanufacturing of these products. So yes, you can do certain things with those products and, um, and it might be that there are standards associated with it. So if you're looking at a piece of equipment, a switch gear, switch boards, uh, motors, and you're going to recondition it, you know, there are rebuilding programs, there are standards, um, there's uh, if you if you if you know the um, the product that you're looking at, Annex A of the National Electrical Code, Informative Annex A says it's titled Product Standards. So for example, if I have a panel board, I would go to Panel Boards. I would go to panel boards. Unfortunately, I, I know the standard number. So it's the standard. It's not in alphabetical order of the title. You go by articles. So article 408, UL67 is a panel board. Uh, switch boards are UL891. So if I can recondition a switch board, I would look at UL891 for my criteria that I would be using uh, in during the reconditioning or re refurbishing uh, solution. Um, so informative annex A is a, is a great uh, area to look at. Now the question is, who is permitted? And, uh, you know, I do a lot of stuff in my garage, okay? I build cabinets. 
I'm going to make guitars. Um, I'm going to be making shelving, all that good stuff. I'm not going to recondition a power circuit breaker in my garage. The question would be, if I decided to start doing that, would you buy one from me? <laughs> right? Um, so if you look at who is authorized to do this work, you're going to be looking at, um, is it the original manufacturer? So in a lot of cases, the manufacturer of the products will recondition and refurbish, remanufacture their own products. Um, in some cases, you might, uh, uh, you might be able to find that there's a program, that there is an organization who does this for a living and they're certified to do that. Uh, there are programs by nationally recognized testing laboratories. They can help you identify who does that type of work, who's good at it. They probably won't tell you who to stay away from unless it's off the record. Um, but in any case, um, you know, in, in the case of a lot of this, especially if it's done at a location, like say it's a power circuit breaker and I'm doing it in my facility. Well, we rebuild this. We rebuild uh, power circuit breakers. Uh, we will... We will have our eyes on it. We may get third-party eyes on it, like uh, uh, Underwriters Laboratories or ETL or something like that, depending upon the needs of the client. Uh, I we, we, in some cases, will farm out some of our uh, uh, work whenever it gets uh, uh, too much. And we've identified uh, individuals or organizations that uh, we know are qualified. They meet our standards. And we will have oversight on the work that they're doing. And, uh, and maybe we will, uh, you know, we know that they have uh, the facilities for testing and the capabilities of testing. And we have our standards that we use uh, that we ensure that they are following as well. So, and I know most manufacturers will do that. So there are people in the business of doing this reconditioned work. And um, I think uh, the one of the organizations is PEARL. I can't remember what PEARL stands for, but P-E-A-R-L or whatever it is. Uh, they'll do stuff like that, do do work like that. So, and and in a lot of cases, a lot of them are under the surveillance and uh, in cooperation with Underwriters Laboratories or ETL or one of these other organizations that uh, that do that. And then they they'll figure out how to determine compliance. So maybe if I'm doing something in the field, I'm going to re. I have a I have a switchboard or a switch gear, and I'm going to recondition it because it's you know it's 50s vintage, and I'm going to do what I can to to get it up and, and running. I'm going to take all the circuit breakers. Maybe I'll put new circuit breakers in, but I'm going to recondition and maybe add some bus work or whatnot uh, and get this uh, large structure ready to take a brand new circuit breaker. Um, I will need a field evaluation uh, to determine if what I'm doing continues to comply with the uh, safety requirements based upon the UL standards that I'm associating, that are associated with that product. And to determine the standards, again, you go to Annex A. Um, and, and, and you can have uh, ETL come out, you can have UL come out, uh, any nationally recognized testing laboratory that has the qualifications to be able to do that review, they'll do that in the field for you. And that is the reconditioned information so that's my deep dive uh, we went through we didn't go through all the different individual standards we went through the requirements professional electrical apparatus reconditioning league that's out of my league all right thanks ryan brian rock if reconditioning is conducted by other than the original manufacturer or by other than an agent authorized by the organization originally responsible for the product, dot, dot, dot. So if I, let's say that I have, uh, there's an organization near Pittsburgh here. I'd love to advertise their name if I could remember it. I met the owners. We had some good discussions about reconditioning. Can't think of their names, but anyway, that organ, that company does power circuit breakers. They do a lot of good stuff. Uh, okay, uh, does the organization responsible for or become considered to be responsible for the product, regardless of whether the original manufacturer's name? Yeah. So here's the thing, Brian. Um, let's say that this organization, that we'll call it uh, Joe Schmuckatelli's Reconditioning Service, uh, and I've got. 
huge buildings on my facility. I've got engineers working with for me. And, you know, I, I'm Joe Schmuckatelli and I'm running this business. And, and you come to me and say, hey, I got a 19, uh, I got an 80s vintage circuit power circuit breaker here or a medium voltage circuit breaker. I need to get it reconditioned. I'll tell you, bring it on over. I, uh, I take that product in. I take it all apart clean all the parts, I lubricate everything, I have to fabricate a couple parts based upon the manufacturers, uh, whatever, I put it all together, I run tests, I get UL to come in and take a look at it, run some tests, they put their little sticker on it. The original manufacturer's name is gonna be on there, the original manufacturer's label is gonna be on there. And why do you want that information? I may want that information because I wanna know some of the trip curve information, or how it was originally, what, 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 what was this originally and the capabilities advertised by the manufacturer. But when I put Joe Schmuckatelli's uh, reconditioning and refurbishing uh, organization's name on it, I own that. I'm responsible for that product. Uh, I would, I, and, and, and I could make an argument that you, as the reconditioner, because you probably changed the, the trip curve as well. Now, unless you did the reconditioning and you made sure that you were within the tolerances of the original time current characteristic curve, then I'd say that's fine. Now, now you're operating within those original time current characteristic curves, but I'll tell you, you need to, um, you need to uh, seriously look at, uh, at, you, know, you need to understand the time current characteristic curves and everything else that are associated with. It. So, when you put your name on it, that's you. Now, uh, you know, will they want to bring me to court? Will they want to bring you to a court, Brian? Probably. You know, who has the deeper pockets, right? Um, but you modified that device. You took it all apart. You assumed ownership of it. It's now your product, and that's what my argument would be on the stand. Uh, Ryan Jackson says, nothing in UL-489 that he can see addresses reconditioning. If a breaker has to be listed as reconditioned, does that mean... Uh, the interrupting rating complies, it, it complies with 489. Is there a different standard? Ryan, what is the title of UL 489, buddy? All right, okay, here we go. Here we go again on our UL 489 standard. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. UL standard 489. Molded case circuit breakers, molded case switches, and circuit breaker enclosures. That's the title of UL-489. Molded case circuit breakers. Let's go to 240.88. 240.88 in the 2020 National Electrical Code says, molded case circuit breakers shall not be permitted to be reconditioned. Why aren't you finding something in 489 about reconditioned circuit breakers, molded case circuit breakers, because you're not permitted to recondition those circuit breakers. With a name like Schmuckatelli, it has to be good. Yeah, baby. And you know, I broke it down not too long ago. I, growing up, growing up as a kid, we always used Joe Schmuckatelli. My uncle would say, Joe Schmuckatelli down the street, or or uh, there was another one too, Joe Schmuckatelli, and there was another one. Um, uh, but I always, you know, it wasn't until recently I said Schmuckatelli. Well, if you break it down, he's a schmuck. <laughs> I don't know what a sh I don't know if there's a definition of the word schmuck. Uh, I don't want to do that on live TV. Uh, there is a term schmuck. Is a Pejorative term, you, Brian, you might know what a pejorative term, meaning one who is stupid or foolish or obnoxious. We'll go with that. Joe Schmuckatelli, uh, uh, an obnoxious person. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's uh, the word came into the English language from Yiddish. And look who's in the house. Tom Lichtenstein. Awesome. We got Tom Lichtenstein in the house. He says, when products are listed as reconditioned, they have to comply with the same requirements as if it was new production of the same equipment. To, kudos, Mr. Lichtenstein. There you go. The UL dollars hard at work at 628 Eastern. Tom, I think you're in Chicago. 
And I think you're an hour behind us. So it's 5.30 your time. It doesn't matter. You are putting in some after hours. I appreciate it. Some U.S. standards, like for vending machines, do have sections to address more common remanufactured end products. Good point, Brian. Good, good dialogue. This is great stuff. Uh, Ryan and, and Ryan, Tom Lichtenstein, if you don't know Tom Lichtenstein, you need to know law, Tom Lichtenstein. Um, hold on. What's this? The audio stream. So hopefully my audio is coming good. Uh, Tom is with UL, and uh, he recently did a presentation in uh, the Western Section meeting last year. And it was on reconditioned equipment. Very knowledgeable individual. Very knowledgeable about the standards and all that good stuff. So you'll uh, you'll want to um, you're going to want to uh, connect with Mr. Lichtenstein. Here's another one, Ryan. Um, here's another one. You remember the movie? So I just learned this too. The movie um, Frankenstein with. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Gene Wilder. Okay. Uh, Gene Wilder is a 1974 m movie. Do you remember the um, horses? Remember, uh, they would say Frau Blucher. Okay. And the horses would go. <laughs> well, Frau Blucher recently passed away. And what I learned was, do you know why the horses would, why her name, whenever they would say her name, why the horses would get scared and, and, and whinny like that? It's because Frau Brucker's name means glue in German. <laughs> I never knew that. I never understood why the horses would go. Fra Blucher, I don't know if I'm saying it right, it means glue. And where do we get glue? From horses, apparently. I've never seen the glue process, but I've always heard that, uh, you know, when horses die, they become glue. I don't know what that means. Young Frankenstein, Frankenstein. So uh, that's a, an interesting little tidbit of information. You never know what you're going to learn here in um on my channel live after five but yes chloris leachman died yes she did yep so and i'm not sure it's, that's her name uh chloris c-l-o-r-i-s leachman actress uh, she passed away january 27th so uh she was a great actress, and I loved her movies. So hopefully she's up there saying kudos to me. All right, everybody. Um, I don't have anything else. Um, so I am going to say I'm ready to call it a day unless you guys and gals have questions. I don't have anything uh, else I wanted to cover. We did a good job in covering. Don't forget about next week, next Thursday. We're going to do a hand calculation on short circuit current using the per unit method. I'm going to uh, get a service. I'll have a, I'll have a, uh, a, a utility. I'm going to eliminate the conductors coming down to the transformer. I'm just going to say I have a utility. I have a transformer. And then I have uh, conductors to a panel board. We're going to do a hand calculation for, for that on using per unit, and then we're gonna put motor contribution downstream, and we're gonna do that one and do a hand calculation using per unit method. You're gonna learn complex variables, you're going to learn per unit, and uh, uh, Thevenin equivalent. You're gonna learn about Mr. Thevenin. Hey, James Smith, awesome, there's my buddy, he, he, James. We're just I was just talking about you earlier. Good to see you, buddy. And uh, you are going to be a uh, point of topic because uh, it was your phone call that prompted this one. So thanks for uh, for dialing in. And Ryan, thank you. Appreciate uh, appreciate everything. And uh, 
appreciate you dialing in. I appreciate everybody dialing in. Don't forget about next week. You're gonna get a. You're gonna need a calculator that can do um, that can do complex numbers like cosine, sine, inverse, tangent. Those are the functions you're gonna be looking for: tangent, inverse tangent, cosine, sine. Um, and we're gonna do it by hand. So you're not gonna need a fancy one, but you're gonna need a. a um, you're gonna need a, a calculator that can handle that. And the calculator that I love, I don't know where my calculator is. It's an HP. My calculator is missing. So I'm, I'm depressed. Uh, but yeah, so you're gonna need a, uh, you're gonna need your calculator. So thanks for dialing in. Thanks, Joe Bellantoni, Brian Rock, James Smith, um, Mr. Lichtenstein, Dr. Lichtenstein, I presume, uh, see who else? We had Daryl Hill. We had, uh, Vincent Della Croce, Robbie Vargas, Joe Bellantoni, Luis Diego Punchy. Thank you for joining us. Gustavo, George Hornfeck. We had a lot of good people today. So thank you for dialing in. Thanks for what you do for electrical safety and the electrical industry. And... God bless you. Please stay safe and by all means, stay healthy. Take care. Great job. I'm going to sign off until next Thursday. See you online.